We're going to be reading from Matthew 22, verse 15 to 22, and you'll find that on page 877 of your Pew Bibles. Uh, Matthew 22, starting at verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to trap him by what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are truthful and teach truthfully the way of God. You don't care what anyone thinks, nor do you show partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Perceiving their malicious intent, Jesus said, Why are you testing me, hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. They brought him a denarius. Whose image and inscription is this? He asked them. Caesar's, they said to him. Then he said to them, Give then to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, Growing up, uh, I'd often spend time with friends from school, uh, just hanging out. Uh, Sometimes those uh, times would uh, progress into meals, and so we'd sit down and have lunch together or dinner together at their place. Uh, Now, most of these friends were non-Christians, uh, and so while I was at, at their place, I learned very quickly on that there were certain topics that were a bit taboo, uh, off limits. Uh, topics that, when raised, would either stutter the conversation or stop it completely. Uh, these two topics, well, I wonder if you can guess, politics and religion. Uh, They're off-limit conversations because everyone knew that when these topics were brought up, inevitably they would split people down one side or the other of the political aisle. Uh, It was social suicide to raise the topics, as doing so had the potential for, at best, a number of awkward uh, minutes of silence or or worse, wildly out-of-control arguments that led to breakdown in family dynamics and cold meals for a week. If you wanted a nice chat over lunch or dinner, pick a safe topic like sport or the weather. Actually, no, with climate change, maybe scrap weather. Just stick to sport. If not, put on a crash helmet, bring up the issues of taxes, and we're off to the races. It's no surprise that if these are hot-button topics for us, then they're hot-button topics for the folks in Jesus' day. Now, it's also not surprising that those wanting to discredit and trap Jesus, when seeking a way to do so, they turn to the topics of politics and religion. Uh, but as we've previously seen, Jesus takes their questions and turns them back at them, and in doing so reveals more than they expected. Now, before we get stuck into the text, let's pray to God. Uh, Heavenly Father, help us to understand your word. I thank you that it brings life uh, to us. Uh, Convict us uh, of areas of our life where we maybe hold back uh, and encourage us uh, to live for you more fully. Amen. Well, as Steve said uh, earlier, uh, this is our last week in Matthew for this year. Uh, If you haven't been with us or if you've missed a week or two, I'd encourage you to go back and have a look at the videos online. Uh, I've really enjoyed it and uh, have gotten a lot out of it. Uh, This series, we've been uh, in the last few weeks of Jesus' ministry and now we are in the last week. We're in between Jesus entering Jerusalem and his crucifixion. Now, the tension is in the city is palpable. Jesus has had run-ins with the religious authorities before, but now it's reached fever pitch. Jesus has just finished telling the parable of the wedding banquet. 
His meaning is clear. Those invited first, those original insiders, had rejected the king's abundant generosity and chosen to ignore and mistreat and kill the king's servants. As a result, the kingdom of heaven was being given to the outsiders, the tax collectors, prostitutes and sinners, are those who understand their need for a saviour and those who depend on God. The Pharisees know that these parables are directed at them. And so in verse 15, we read, Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to trap Jesus by what he said. Uh, to trap Jesus in his words. Now, it seems as though they've overcome their lack of courage from earlier when we read in chapter 21, verse 46, that although they were looking for a way to arrest Jesus, they feared the crowds. Now, this is not the first time that we've heard that the Pharisees want to take Jesus down. But unlike other times, the Pharisees don't come alone and they come with a plan. They've devised a plot and devi- uh, they've plotted and devised a trap. I should have mentioned that there are um, a sermon summary in your outline, and we're up to point three. Uh, so the Pharisees have regrouped and they've devised a plan. Not only them, but they've wrangled in some unlikely help. In verse sixteen, we read that they'd sent their disciples to Jesus along with the Herodians. Now, it's at this point in the in the film that you get the ominous music, now the dun-dun-dun, the Pharisees and Herodians. And now, at first read, it might not sound like much. Just two different groups asking an innocent question about money from an obscure Galilean preacher. But in reality, these groups are major players in the region. And instead of seeking the wisdom of Jesus, they are seeking to entrap him. The Pharisees and the Herodians. They're not a likely ally, but despite, but desperate times call for desperate measures. Uh, on one, ultra-Orthodox and ultra-nationalist, the Pharisees combine with other quizzling Herodians who would sell out their country for greater favour with Rome. In any other situation, these two groups would not be seen together. But against a common enemy, exceptions are made. It's kind of like the rivalry between the manly sea eagles and panthers, the eels or the bulldogs. They're not likely to be chummy together. But pit them against a common enemy, they form the blues and they verse Queensland. And just like the Pharisees and the Herodians, they lose. (laughs) Unfortunately. (laughs) Who knows, that might change. (laughs) They've come together and devised a question so clever that it boxes Jesus into a seemingly impossible corner. With as much flattery and ironic truth, they come to Jesus and say, Teacher, We know that you are truthful and teach truthfully the way of God. If that's the case, why aren't they listening? You don't care what anyone thinks, nor do you show partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, on first glance, it's a pretty simple question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? So why is it so loaded? And what's at stake if Jesus gets it wrong? Uh, Two things about the question itself. Uh, The tax, uh, it's singular. Uh, This was the poll tax paid direct to Rome. Uh, It was a reminder and mark for the Jews that they are under political subjection to a foreign power. They are occupied and therefore must pay tax. Uh, It's not just a... Uh, market tax or other taxes. Uh, Lawful. Is it lawful to pay taxes? Uh, It's not about Roman law, but rather is it permissible under the law of God for the people of God to express allegiance to a pagan emperor in paying? And so that's what they're asking. Uh, The answer to the question 
is in those who are asking the question. So if for one, on one hand, if Jesus says it is lawful, it plays into the hands of the Pharisees. They can go back and say that Jesus is pro-Roman, and it would be a very unpopular view among the common people. If Jesus, however, says that it isn't lawful, it plays into the hands of the Herodians. Now, they can say that Jesus is anti-Rome, and it would be equal to treason. And it was only 30 years before this event that another man, Judas from Galilee, opposed Roman taxation and went on a revolt. They are hoping that Jesus aligns himself with one side or the other so that they might accuse him of being pro-Roman and losing favour with the crowds or anti-Roman and being tried for treason. So that's the trap they have laid. If there was a time that the Pharisees were open-minded to Jesus and his teaching, that time has clearly passed. Jesus, perceiving their malicious intent, says, Why are you testing me, hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. Oh, we're at uh, point four in verse 18. Now, Jesus doesn't mince words here, does he? He tells it like he sees it. And what he sees is hypocrites who ask one thing but mean or act in a completely different way. Just an aside, uh, this week uh, I'd encourage you to keep reading uh, Jesus' critique of the religious authorities uh, that follows on from this section in chapter 22 and 23. Jesus is brutal and for good reason. Uh, We pick up seven woes of the Pharisees and scribes. These Pharisees and scribes and elders should have been the ones who reflected God's good laws the most. They should have been the ones who would be caring for the blind, for the lame, for the poor and outcast, for the oppressed, the foreigner and the alien resident. Their job was to be good stewards of what God had given them. But instead, as we've seen, they've restricted worship of God by putting up barriers, both physically, as we've seen in the temple courts with the money changes, and spiritually, by rejecting the messengers of God that he'd sent to them and denying the words God had spoken to them. Uh, In the little interchange with John the Baptist, we can see that. Jesus is highlighting their hypocrisy by showing their true intentions. And to answer their phony question, Jesus asks for a coin that is used to pay the tax. Verses 19 to 21, uh, they brought to him a denarius. Jesus asked them, whose image and inscription is this? Caesar's, they said to him. It was clear to those present that it was the face and name of the emperor that was on the coin. Just like Queen Elizabeth is on all of our coins. Most commentators agree that the coin that they gave had the imprint of Caesar Tiberius, who was the emperor at the time. The inscription was Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. And on the opposite side was a picture of the Roman goddess of peace, Pax, with the Latin inscription, High Priestess. And so the coin is symbolically loaded. Jesus, a Caesar holding claim to be a god, demanding his subjects pay tribute to him. Uh, Now, if you're really curious, you can pick one of these coins up on eBay for about $800, I thought about it, but I wasn't quite sure I'd get it past Lynn on my ministry expense account. So maybe I'll say that for another time. They've given or they've shown Jesus a coin with the emperor's face on it. It's this point that Jesus gives a masterful answer to a trick question and springs his own trap, rebuking his questioners. Point five. Uh, he declares that the co- that if the coin is made in the image of Caesar, then give back to Caesar what Caesar's. They are enjoying the benefits of Roman occupation, like aqueducts 
sanitation, education and imperial roads. It was only right to pay back what was owed. And if it was his face on it, why not give it back to him? In this way, Jesus essentially shrugs off the challenge as a false dilemma. One can honour the requirements of a secular government without embracing all that it stands for. Paying the tax to Rome, then, is a separate question from the issues of the Old Testament law. Now, if that's where Jesus had stopped, that would have been enough of an answer to satisfy the questioning Pharisees and Herodians. But Jesus cuts deeper and adds that while they are required to give back to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, they are also required to give back to God the things that are God's. Those seeking to trap Jesus were amazed at Jesus' response and understood its meaning and responded, realized it was a rebuke and not just a clever answer. No, they're amazed and just left and went away. Jesus had just challenged them to think through what it means to give to God the things that are God's, and they seem content with the clever answer regarding Caesar. I don't think that they understood Jesus at all, because if they did, they probably would have reacted in a stronger way, either positively or negatively. For the Herodians, they lived for their social status and political influence under Rome, and their identity was connected with position. In the same way, the Pharisees were concerned with their own social status as the religious elites, the insiders. Had they understood, they may have questioned whether Jesus' words about giving to God the things that are God might jeopardise their comfort, status and security that it might have expanded their view of living as God's people and maybe understood the rebuke that they had misplaced priorities. Priorities that sought their own kingdom and not Jesus's. I wonder if, like so many times over the course of this Matthew series, if we uncomfortably feel like we resonate with the Pharisees more than we would like to admit. In the end, they're content with responding to Jesus in a very mild way. In this instance, they didn't, seem, they didn't see him as a threat to their authority and were just amazed at his cleverness. So they left him and went away. And so it begs the question, how do we respond to Jesus' answer? Do we stand back and give Jesus a kudos for the way he got out of a tight situation? Or do we press into his answer and wrestle with the mammoth implications of Jesus' words? Now, so at point six on the outline, radical living as God's image bearers. Uh, from Jesus' answer, there are two basic parts. Give back to Caesar what's Caesar's and God's, give to God what's God's. Now, Jesus is very particular when he uses the word image when asking about the coin. Now, Jesus uses the coin and its image to connect giving back to Caesar and giving back to God. Uh, it's pretty simple, as Bernard mentioned, uh, pretty much stole all my thunder. Uh, in effect, Jesus is saying, give to Caesar what bears his image and give back to God that which bears his image. Now, firstly, Caesar. Jesus points out that it is right to pay what is owed back to those in authority. Governments are under God's given authority and instituted by him and are placed in a position for the good of its citizens. Uh, if you want to have a look more at this, I encourage you to read Romans 13, 1 to 7. We live in one of the most stable and prosperous countries in the world. We enjoy the benefits of living in a society where we have access to clean water, low-cost uh, health care, 
good education, good roads and infrastructure. The list goes on. So when tax time comes, pay your tax. Pay it willfully and honestly, not begrudgingly or bemoaning. Don't try to avoid it or fraud the, fraud the system. The government under which we live has given us so much to be thankful for to God. So give back to it what is rightfully due. In one sense, that's the easy application from what Jesus tells us. It's the part where the Pharisees and Herodians stopped. Paying tax, which we're legally obligated to do, is easy. Jesus' second word has far greater implications. If we owe Caesar what bears his image, what then do we owe God? Give back to God that which bears God's image. Jesus' words should have sent his hearers both originally and now back to Genesis 1, to the creation account, where God created humanity in his own image. We heard that read out for us earlier. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God made man in his image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. Now, what then do we owe God? We owe God that which bears the image of God. All of humanity belongs to God. Jesus' answer makes clear that human beings are responsible not just for giving their money to whichever government issues it, but also to give ourselves to the God who made us. Uh, If this is right for all of humanity who are made in God's image, how much more for those who are in Christ? Uh, Jesus doesn't break down how much we owe back to God, but I get the feeling it isn't uh, what you like at the time. Jesus doesn't stipulate how much to give back, but rather to give back what's made in God's image. It's not two out of four Sundays or 10% of your income. Outside of that, you are free to do as you will. No, Jesus is expecting wholehearted followers who recognize his authority and act accordingly. Jesus is saying, give back all that you are. For him and his kingdom. Yeah, you know, give them give the government your tax. Give God everything else. Your time and talents, your resources, finances and knowledge, your dreams and aspirations. From your dining room table for hospitality to your words for declaring his praises, what areas of your life do you need to be giving back to God? What areas of your life are you withholding from God? This applies if you're 7, 47 or 87. Whether you've just started kindergarten, finished high school, just starting a profession, young marrieds, families, retirees. If you are made in the image of God, Jesus' words apply to you. The Apostle Paul grasped the abundant and extravagant grace that God has given us in Jesus. Because of that, he says in Romans 12, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true act of worship. For Paul, there was no limit to the service we owe God for his mercies. Last week, we heard about the wedding banquet that God has prepared for his people. An abundant, extravagant blessing for those dependent on God. And nothing we give up in this life will be missed in the next. And so we can take joy in giving back to God the things that are already his. Give to Caesar the things made in the image of Caesar, but give to God the things that are made in the image of God. Let's pray.
Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for your word. Thank you that uh, Jesus uh, deals uh, with this uh, tricky question and he doesn't leave it at a a superficial level, uh, just about the tax, uh, but cuts to the heart of the issue of giving ourselves to God fully. I pray that as we go into this week, uh, that we would look at areas of our lives where uh, we do withhold from you. I pray that we would seek ways uh, to live for you uh, wholeheartedly as followers of you. Amen.